Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Contagion. My name is John Parkinson, and I'm the senior editor. Joining us today is Dr. Carrie Wong, who is executive director and product development lead in global clinical development of infectious disease at Merck. Thank you, doctor, for being able to join us today. Yep, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Excellent. Let's jump right into the topic. For Isla Trevier, can you talk about this investigational therapy, including its class of drug indications and what you're hoping to achieve with it? Yeah, so Zlatchevir is our novel uh, agent. Uh, it's in a new class, which we call nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, or NRTTI. And Zlatchevir has several unique properties that we believe uh, can make it uh, as the foundation of of the future Merck regimens, both within treatment and in prevention. And some of these properties include its high potency, uh, it's 10 times more potent than any other approved antiretroviral that's out there. Uh, it has a high barrier to resistance. Uh, it also has a long half-life and also wide tissue distribution within the body. So based on these uh, unique properties, we feel that is a ideal agent to be combined uh, with others uh, as a, as a treatment regimen or uh, prevention. And so right now, uh, you know, currently in development, uh, we have uh, the Duravirine Islachivir program, which is a daily treatment program. And, uh, you know, we will be presenting additional data from our phase 2 trial next week, I think it's 2020, uh, uh, supporting the data that we presented last year uh, from the week 48 results. And based on those week 48 results last year, uh, you know, it gave us the confidence that this two-drug uh, combination uh, could be a highly efficacious uh, treatment regimen. And so we did initiate a comprehensive phase three program uh, earlier this year and started enrollment in four phase three trials across three different patient populations, including the treatment naive population, uh, population, as well as the population with the highest unmet medical need. Uh, those uh, who are heavily treatment experienced and have uh, multi-drug resistance. So, uh, you know, we're very excited uh, about this program, but I think this is just a first step, uh, you know, with, you know, with our programs moving forward uh, with this last year. And looking at this therapy, uh, Merck is developing a subdermal drug eluding implant to administer it. Can you update us on that progress? Yeah, so we uh, uh, presented uh, data last year uh, at the IES 2019 in Mexico City on the drug eluding uh, uh, stent uh, that has uh, Zlatchevir, and it does a phase one study uh, using a prototype uh, implant. And so uh, what I can comment on right now is that the work continues you know, on, on, that, uh, on that program, and uh, you know, we hope to you know, be in the clinic soon. And you talked about a little bit earlier about uh, your research with the two, the combination therapy, Isla Trevere and Doravirine. Uh, for those who are not familiar with it, can you provide an overview of the studies associated with these therapies? And, you know, overall, what, you know, what's the good news? Sure. So Doravirine is our non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, uh, which we developed. And uh, Doravirine was a first approved uh, back in 2018. And that approval was based on three phase three trials. Uh, we have two treatment naive trials, Drive Forward and Drive Ahead. Uh, Drive Forward evaluated uh, deriving in combination with two TIs compared to uh, boosted darunavir and two NRTIs. And Drive Ahead uh, compared the fixed dose combination of deriving uh, lamivudine and tenofovir disoproxyfumarate against uh, efavirenz, uh, uh, antricytabine, and uh, tenofovir disoproxyfumarate. And so based on the results of those treatment naive trials, we got our initial uh, approval in the treatment naive uh, population. And in those trials, uh, we were able to demonstrate that Doravirine had high efficacy uh, you know, compared to the comparators and also had a you know, very good uh, safety and tolerability profile. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that Doravirine has superior uh, psychiatric uh, and CNS adverse event profile compared to Favrin's. And we were also able to demonstrate that uh, Doravirine had a, a better profile in terms of lipids uh, compared to both Doravirine and Favrin's. In addition, we also had a phase three trial, Drive Shift, uh, that evaluated uh, switching participants who were on a stable antiviral uh, regimen to our fixed dose uh, combination with Doravirine uh, Delstrigo. And again, 
uh, in that trial, we were able to demonstrate that uh, switching to uh, the deriving regimen was not inferior uh, to remaining on their baseline regimen. So I think, you know, based on, on, the, on the results from those trials, uh, we felt uh, very strongly about the efficacy, uh, resistance, and uh, safety tolerability profile of deravirine and found it to be an ideal agent to combine with aslatrovir, as I mentioned, the properties of aslatrovir. And so uh, we initiated, uh, you know, phase 2b trial, protocol 11, uh, to evaluate that combination. And so protocol 11 uh, is a phase 2b dose ranging trial. Uh, where we evaluated three doses of the Zlachivir, 0.25 milligrams, 0.75 milligrams, and 2.25 milligrams in combination with Duravri. Uh, in the first part of that trial, uh, because it was in treatment IE population and Duravri had not been uh, approved yet, uh, lamivudine or 3TC was added to that regimen. So a three-drug regimen uh, with Duravri and Zlachivir uh, was initiated in that trial. But then once uh, participants uh, were suppressed on, uh, to uh, undetectable levels, uh, HIV RNA less than 50 copies per ml, the lamivudine component of that regimen was removed and the participants continued on their randomized dose of Zlatrovir in combination with Duravir. And then once uh, the dose selection uh, for Zlatrovir uh, was determined, uh, which was a 0.75 milligram dose, uh, all the participants uh, in, in, that, in those Lachavir arms were then switched to the uh, 0.75 milligram dose and then continued on uh, Duravirine. Uh, the comparator in that trial uh, was a fixed dose combination of Duravirine, uh, Limavidine, and Tenofovir. So you know, we initially presented the data, uh, the 24-week and 48-week data from that trial last summer. And uh, we've also presented uh, metabolic uh, data at CROI earlier this year. And we will be presenting two uh, other oral presentations based on that data uh, at AIDS 2020 next week. Uh, the first uh, presentation uh, uh, further uh, uh, delineates and analyzes the safety profile seen through 48 weeks uh, with that combination of the Zlatrovir and Duravirine, uh, showing that the majority of the adverse events were mild and transient and with very few discontinuations. And then the second oral abstract that will be uh, presented uh, by Chloe Orkin uh, next week is a, a further analysis of those uh, participants who met the criteria of protocol defined uh, virologic failure, uh, demonstrating that you know, those uh, participants who met that very strict criteria uh, had uh, you know, HIV RNA less than 200 copies per ml at a clinical, clinically significant level and were likely blips, and that none of those participants uh, developed any resistance to any of the study drugs. So I think you know, that's a high-level overview of kind of the late-stage clinical trials uh, supporting both the Ravine and the Slatchview that we have at this time. Sounds like some promising news. What are the next steps for these therapies? Right. So as I mentioned uh, before, we have initiated a comprehensive uh, phase three program uh, with the Ravine and Slatchview. Uh, across three different uh, patient populations. So we do you know, feel very confident based on the results that we have gotten from the phase 2B trial uh, to initiate across uh, this broad uh, uh, group of patients. And so uh, you know, those stu studies are currently uh, enrolling. And uh, so that, will, that, that is the first uh, step of the program. In addition, uh, you know, we're also exploring uh, opportunities uh, and partners uh, to pair Aslatrovir up uh, uh, for a long-acting treatment uh, type regimen. And so that work is ongoing. And then we also have a very active uh, prevention program. So currently we have uh, one uh, trial on phase two trial ongoing protocol 16, uh, looking at the uh, pharmacokinetics and safety of uh, oral aslatrovir given uh, once a month. And so those, uh, those programs are also moving forward. Excellent. Changing gears and looking at the big picture perspective, what would you say, doctor, are the biggest areas of unmet HIV medical therapy needs? Yeah, so, I mean, today, you know, we have excellent therapies that are available. I mean, the therapies that we have today are, are you know, such a far cry from what we had initially uh, uh, in the epidemic. However, uh, even though we have such excellent therapies, uh, there do remain uh, some significant unmet medical needs. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have, you know, uh, uh, patients who are heavily treatment experienced and have uh, multi-drug resistance uh, to currently available medications. So there's always a need uh, for new antiretrovirals that are able to be effective against those viruses. 
in addition, you know, even though we have these uh, new therapies and the safety and tolerability profile are, you know, uh, are excellent, you know, we still have, uh, you know, issues. Uh, there's no one regimen that's perfect for the entire population. So I think, uh, and that's evidenced by, you know, the amount of switching that you see in the different regimens even today. And so, you know, some of the things that we found recently uh, in terms of weight gain associated with some of the newer regimens, you know, those are some of those uh, things uh, that we need to address. In addition, you know, the, the HIV uh, population is aging. You know, over half of the people living with HIV are over 50, and that percentage is just going to be increasing further. And so, you know, a lot of these patients have uh, associated comorbidities and uh, other, you know, um, uh, diseases such as diabetes or hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and uh, are on other medications. And so we, we need antiretrovirals uh, that have uh, minimal drug-drug interactions as well. And then hopefully what we can achieve moving to the future uh, with some of these uh, newer uh, extended duration uh, type treatment regimens is you know, to, to allow uh, people living with HIV to control their uh, virus uh, with less frequent dosing. Uh, and stigma is still a big issue. Uh, and you know, for some patients taking a pill every day you know, reminds them uh, that they have HIV. So if there are ways that we can you know, lessen that you know, through uh, weekly, monthly, or even uh, yearly uh, administration of antiretrovirals, all that uh, I think would be beneficial. Absolutely, you make some really good points all the way around. And doctor, how would you characterize the state of AIDS cure, cure research overall? Yeah, so the, so the biology around the uh, HIV cure is really fascinating. And you know, there's been tremendous amount of progress that has, made, has been made uh, in HIV cure research over the last several years. Uh, you know, there's lots of work looking at the latent reservoir, and also you know, a lot of different uh, strategies. You know, from broadly neutralizing antibodies, uh, therapeutic vaccines, uh, you know, latency reversing agents. Um, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of uh, different ideas and strategies have been put forward. However, you know, I think you know, the clinical trials to date with some of these agents have, um, you know, have been you know, so, uh, somewhat disappointing in terms of the results. Uh, so I think right now we're still in that learning uh, phase and the research phase and uh, getting a better understanding of uh, HIV latency. And I think you know, so some of the things that uh, still need to be developed are you know, the assays, uh, you know, easier assays to uh, perform to be able to assess uh, the size of the latent reservoir. Uh, moving forward. You know, I think uh, now with, uh, you know, with COVID-19 uh, and all those issues, a lot of um, HIV research and uh, uh, scientists have shifted over to COVID, so there may be you know, probably a little bit less emphasis on some of the cure research, but you know, I, I know that there are still ongoing clinical trials. Uh, here at Merck, you know, we, we are actively involved uh, in HIV cure research and you know, with a focus on you know, latency reversing agents as well as developing assays uh, to look at the latent reservoir. And so you know, I'm, I'm very confident that Merck you know, is uh, committed uh, to that research and the innovation that's necessary to drive that science forward uh, and has actively been working with uh, external partners as well. Lastly, and, and speaking of COVID-19, uh, as we're having to do conferences uh, virtually nowadays, can you talk a little bit about some of the benefits and challenges associated with doing conferences this way? Yeah, so I think it's it's great that uh, you know the, the science that's being done is still being able to be disseminated across uh, to to all the to the scientists and physicians and patients uh, to to see that data. But yeah, it has been you know definitely a challenge you know with you know virtual meetings starting with Croy and now AIDS twenty twenty next week. Uh, you know, the biggest challenge, I think, is that, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that people have at the poster sessions or in the hallways, you know, those are the conversations that really push science forward. You know, the, the co collaborations um, and, and the exchange of ideas that occurs at conferences. I think that's uh, probably the biggest impact uh, uh, that we're seeing with these virtual meetings and, and not being able to get together uh, with collaborators. Absolutely, that person-to-person -person interaction with colleagues and peers, it's deeply missed, I'm sure. Thank you, doctor, for taking the time today to discuss this important research. Yeah, appreciate your time, and uh, thank you very much.